Right, so it's a, it's an exciting time for the field. Uh, there's been a, a, a tremendous amount of progress. I think where we were 10 years ago is we had uh, some initial viruses that were in the clinic that showed some promise but also identified some hurdles for the field. So it's clear we needed more potent agents. Uh, uh, we needed better IV delivery. And I think we also realized that we, we didn't want to rely on one mechanism of action, but we wanted to engineer viruses with multiple mechanisms. So I think over the last 10 years, it's really been an exciting time where we've come up with uh, new viral species and new engineered viral uh, products that have uh, greater potency as a single agent, uh, better IV delivery, and uh, multiple mechanisms of action. So what we reported on uh, yesterday was uh, data with JX594 in clinical trials. So this is a targeted and transgene-armed uh, oncolytic pox virus for cancer. Uh, we reported uh, data from over 100 patients treated to date with JX594 showing safety, proof of concept for mechanism of action, and also uh, evidence of anti-cancer activity in phase one. And then I think most importantly and very exciting is that we reported uh, survival data from a randomized phase two study showing that high dose GX594 actually improved survival uh, in uh, patients with advanced liver cancer. So, a relatively small phase two study, only 30 patients, but certainly uh, strongly supportive of now going to larger randomized controlled uh, phase 2B and 3 studies. A virus strain that's been in millions of healthy children as a vaccine worldwide. Uh, so it's a very well-known agent. And what we've done is we've engineered it for greater cancer targeting, cancer specificity, um, which will essentially translate into safety enhancement. And we've also engineered into it um, a therapeutic transgene, which will augment a second mechanism of action, uh, which is immune stimulation. So we now have a product that uh, attacks cancer cells through direct viral cell lysis and through uh, induction of anti-cancer immunity. We've also discovered that it has a third mechanism of action, which was fortuitous that we, uh, we're just now starting to understand, and that is that GX594 can also infect endothelial cells within the tumor and knock out the blood supply to the tumor. So we believe we have an agent with three distinct complementary mechanisms of action. You showed data showing that there were apparently waves of, of release of, of um, live virus from the tumor. How does that square with the vascular collapse that you think is part of the mechanism of action? Well, it's a, it's a complex interplay. So what you're referring to is exactly right, is that with viral replication in a cancer, we can, uh, by, by sampling the blood over time, we can see virus coming back out into the blood as it's replicating and shedding. Now, uh, given certain tumors have more vascular shutdown, I would imagine that that would actually reduce the amount of virus that gets back out into the circulation. So I think how much virus we see in the circulation will be dependent on how much actual viral replication is ongoing and also the degree of, of vascular shutdown. In terms of safety, you said the virus had been engineered for increased safety, but the, the vaccine strain actually in about three in a million um, showed severe to neurotoxicity. What's your feeling about um, the likelihood of toxicity coming up later in the development of this agent? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, again, as medical products go, if we, you know, cancer agents typically have toxicity rates and uh, well, well in excess of, of what was seen with the live viral vaccine in healthy humans. Uh, and the risk benefit for terminal cancer patients uh, certainly uh, uh, advocates for taking some risk and having some toxicity, and that's really been the history of the field. Um, that having been said, certainly to date, we're happy with the, the toxicity. We've not seen significant organ toxicity. We do specifically exclude patients who were shown to be at higher risk of toxicity in those vaccination campaigns. So patients with severe immunosuppression, uh, eczema, uh, severe eczema, uh, and, and some other disorders, uh, we specifically exclude them to, to minimize the chance of toxicity. So really the next step is to take this strong clinical proof of concept and actually get the product approved. Um, that will require large randomized controlled studies. Um, the next study that we'll do is, is a phase 2B randomized controlled study of GX594 versus placebo in patients with advanced liver cancers who have failed serafinib therapy. So that will be 120 patients randomized 2 to 1, uh, 80 patients to GX594, 40 to placebo, and the primary endpoint of that study will be overall survival. Uh, and so we expect that that's, uh, you know, again, could potentially lead to product approval if that were positive and, and if our manufacturing is up to, 
up to the point where it needs to be. And then in parallel, we'll be initiating uh, a frontline liver cancer study comparing JX594 head to head with serafinib. A number of other viruses are under development. Um, what do you, what's your feeling about their chances of uh, getting to market too? Well, I think it's exciting. I think there's uh, certainly in phase three now, we have uh, certainly late stage development. We have our product, we have the BioVex product, which is a herpes virus also engineered to express GMCSF, uh, which really acts as a local oncolytic plus a cancer vaccine. They're currently in phase three in melanoma, so that's uh, exciting times for them. And I think that, that clinical trial is nearing completion of enrollment, so we may have data back from that study in the next year. Uh, the Rio virus uh, from Oncolytics, which is a non-engineered wild-type virus, is being used in combination with chemotherapy in a variety of cancer types, including head and neck, uh, cancer in a phase three. So it's an exciting time, and I think behind those viruses will be another wave of, of next-generation viruses, new viral species, new therapeutic transgenes, you know, building on what we've seen with these, uh, the viruses that are currently in the forefront. You mentioned um, Biobex. Amgen has just acquired the... The, uh, the product for a, a billion dollars. What right. do you think that's going to do for the field? Well, I think it's a huge, it's a huge boost. Uh, you know, I, I think as scientists we're critical thinkers, but I also think that there's a certain amount of uh, a little bit of a herd mentality, particularly in the in industry. Uh, nobody wants to be the first one to put a bet down with a brand new therape therapeutic approach like this. So I think it took a lot of courage on the part of of Amgen to do it. I think it was a great decision, and I. I certainly believe that that's going to lead to a number of companies coming back and looking at this space and saying, hey, this has been great science for a decade, maybe, but maybe it's now it's ready for prime time, it's, it's ready for product approval. Where do you think that oncolytics are going to fit ultimately into the management of cancer patients? Well, I think that the history of, of cancer treatment is, is that combining different therapies with different mechanisms of action and different toxicity profiles. Uh, is, is definitely the way to go if you want to uh, control and eventually eradicate cancer and, and cure patients. So I think um, oncolytic viruses are, are well positioned in that they have a distinct mechanism of action that's very different from the other therapies and the toxicity profile is non-overlapping. So I think combination therapy with viruses plus chemotherapeutics and tyrosine kinase inhibitors and antibodies, you know, eventually we'll, we'll figure out the right uh, way to use them to maximize the clinical benefit, and I think when you do that, you could have a very, very potent uh, therapeutic regimen.